Harry, hello, how are you doing? I am very well, Andy, how are you? I'm good, thank you, I'm good. Having been um, happily scuzzy through every single video so far in my hoodie and my t-shirts, I have dressed up specially for you because I knew you would be um, presenting a particular sartorial challenge, so I'm fine. I am, I am honoured by that stage <laughs> normal practice. Can I get you to introduce yourself and give us an overview of your work, please? Yes, absolutely. So I'm Harry McCarthy, and until very recently, I taught English in the English department at the University of Exeter. Uh, and as of the autumn, I'll be taking up a research fellowship at Jesus College in Cambridge. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm, my home is. Uh, and my research really um, is based on two strands, uh, which are directly interrelated. Uh, one is historical performance and one is contemporary performance. Uh, so my PhD was about boy actors in 16th and 17th century theatre. Um, so we all know, or most of us know, that there were no uh, con uh, professional female actresses on the public stages of early modern England. That's, I think that's enough caveats to kind of <laughs> suggest that I don't completely believe there were no women in the theatre at all. Um, but most of the evidence suggests that female roles in, for the paying public in public playhouses were played by boy actors, uh, which is a fairly uh, flexible use of the word boy there. So probably aged between uh, adolescence to early 20s. Uh, there were also companies of boy, entirely made up of boy actors who were perhaps slightly younger to begin with, but obviously then grew up. Um, so when we're thinking about boys, we're thinking about a very flexible use of that term in terms of biological age. Mm. Um, so they played all of the female roles in, in, in the public theatres, as well as uh, obviously quite a few male ones. So young men, as well as boys and little girls, very occasionally. Um, although you don't tend to get that many little girls on, on stage for, for some reason. Um, I'm sure now you can think of about 10 examples where you can, but I, I haven't found that many in my own reading. Uh, so the work on boy actors has typically tended to be focused on audience reception, whether audience believed that these boys were really women or the kinds of um, perhaps slightly um, unconventional responses that those boy actors would have prompted in their audiences. I was much more interested in looking at them as actors. Uh, so thinking about the skills that they learned, how they may have acquired them, uh, and the ways in which those skills infiltrate the plays as we now have them. So we've only got the material record of the plays in forms of text. How can we kind of recover a sense of boy actors' performances from that? And part of what I do there is use contemporary performance, um, so staging experiments and practical work, also observing theatre companies to kind of think about how uh, theatrical work today can shed light on the practices of the past. Um, so that was quite a rambling um description but that's basically it boys and performances in a nutshell yeah thank you very much um uh yeah I, I don't know how i feel about the idea that women didn't perform on the stages at, on the professional stages at all i've got to the point where i now just say that that was the norm rather than the constant yeah. i suppose um but yes absolutely we have these these weirdly all-male communities of both um men being defined as as adult men with um the occasional boy uh, mm. On the one hand, and then on the other, this group of um, male performers who are being who are being defined in terms of their youth, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you finish there by talking to us about using contemporary performance. Um, and if I understood you rightly, you kind of talked about two different kind of ways of engaging with contemporary performance. And one was simply simply is the wrong word, but one was as an audience member watching yeah. productions from which you are otherwise not involved, mm -hmm. and the other is yourself staging performance and um, staging workshops, practical workshops to try things out. Did I get that right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So what I've done in the past is I've worked closely with an all boy company uh, based in Stratford upon Avon, Edwards Boys, whose website is uh, kind of bursting with brilliant resources and videos of their previous performances of non-Shakespearean early modern drama. I should flag as well that I'm very interested in non-Shakespearean early modern drama. Uh, and so I've worked closely with them and analysed their performances and their rehearsal practices and so on, but also, and slightly more terrifyingly for someone who doesn't have a background in theatre, um, I've also staged workshops, um, either privately with students in the university drama studio, um, because they're brilliant but also cheap, uh, but also in um, the, at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse in Shakespeare's Globe as part of their Research in Action event. And those are much more, they're not full-scale productions, they're targeted around particular scenes that when you read them, you can't quite work out what might be happening on the stage, or there seems to be something weird going on that actors need to make choices about. So 
uh, that's that's the kind of two ways of thinking about contemporary performance, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant that cheap is a status to to aim for. I feel in yes lots of different ways. <laughs> yeah. um, can you tell us a bit more? And is it possible to get some examples of the sort of what you're talking about at the end there about testing things out on stage? So where you've got something in a in a in a text from a 16th or 17th century, uh, which isn't making sense or is raising questions, mm. you're then exploring that moment in a workshop. Could you tell us how that works? Please? Yeah, so for me, it's uh, it initially started by reading a lot of plays that I'd never read before and scarcely even heard of um, by playwrights who haven't typically been edited to anywhere near the standard that Shakespeare is edited time and again. Uh, so that mainly means working with kind of digital facsimiles of original play quartos, which haven't been re-edited since, or occasionally a kind of some guy in the 19th century who did it as a hobby and, and it's still an old spelling and it doesn't have any footnotes. Um, there's a middle ground between that and there are some brilliant kind of single text editions of some of these plays, but they, they haven't all been edited um, even once, let alone multiple times. Mm. So what happens there is that you've got nothing really to guide you through anything that might be going on on stage. And actually editions of Shakespeare's plays don't always kind of indicate the kinds of actions that are happening on the stage either. Um, but for me, I was reading plays uh, like John Marston's What You Will, which was performed by an all boys company around 1600, 1601, which hasn't been edited, is currently being edited, but for the first time um, since its, its initial printing, and it doesn't seem to have been performed professionally either. And at the beginning of one scene, this group of women come on stage and one of them says, bring the shuttlecock. And then later on, one of them brings a shuttlecock. But there's nothing in the description, in the, the stage directions, there are no stage directions uh, to suggest what happens with that. But there seems to be an indication that the women are playing with it in some way. So they might be, um, you know, they sort of say things like down or tis down, uh, serve it again, that kind of thing, which seemed to indicate to me that they're playing badminton. Yeah. Or the early modern equivalent, I think it's, it's called battledore and shuttlecock. Um, so battledores were, were not stringed, um, tennis rackets were stringed, um, but battledores are kind of wooden bats. So they're sort of playing ping pong with a, with a shuttlecock, it seemed to me. Uh, so I wondered what that might look like on stage and whether I could find other examples from around the same period or later uh, where games are being played on stage. And there are, there are quite a few examples of that. Um, which is perhaps surprising given that that play was designed for an indoor playhouse that we tend to think of as being quite small. Uh, so other plays feature bowls tournaments, um, games of blind man's buff, those were the two, the three sports that I focused on, but there are other, you know, characters might throw a ball to one another or a series of balls to one another, um, or uh, throw spears. Um, there's, a, there's a brilliant play called The Four Apprentices of London by Thomas Haywood, where four apprentices toss their pikes is the stage direction, mm -hmm. um, which seems to kind of uh, sort of like javelin throwing and that kind of thing. So there are these little glimpses of physical activity, uh, if not in stage directions, then in sort of suggested by the dialogue. And I was interested in seeing what that looks like or what that what choices that forces actors to make when they have to keep playing these games while also acting the scene. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm fascinated in lots of that and trying to think how best to start unpacking it. Um, the issue of sports and games in a play, I think, is um, is really exciting and really interesting. And right from the start of these video series, um, Callan Davis was encouraging us to think about um, plays as a form of playing. And, and Callan's own work um, has been really exciting uh, on the connections between bowling alleys and yes. playhouses themselves. And now you're yeah. showing us that bowling is an activity happening within plays. Yes. Uh, uh, so there's something going on on there. There's something going on, around, given the quotations you just gave us around the kind of shuttlecockery of that moment, if that's the right word. Um, yeah, it's a brilliant word. I mean, it sounds like the script is deliberately playing with both sport, but also sexual forms of sporting. Mm. Um, so serving and getting the shuttlecock up and down there seems to be all kinds of things going on there potentially um, yes there's, there's yeah. a group of women playing sports on stage um yeah can you help us think through any or all of that <laughs> i'll start i'll start the shuttlecockery um <laughs> because part part of um the work my work in sort of thinking about what these games look like is also what they meant to early moderns and what the terminology means um which is often quite difficult you don't have 
um, you know, there weren't the equivalent of the kind of Guardian sports pages in, in this time, although people did write uh, commonplace books and things, noting down the rules to games, and some of those have survived. And there are also um, printed books tend to focus more on how to cheat at these games or how naughty and wicked and evil they are. There's, there doesn't really, there aren't really many kind of how-to guides. Uh, but shuttlecock is a word that gets used pejoratively to describe men who um, are sexually available to women. Uh, so an insult would be to call someone a shuttlecock who's tossed from one lady to another. Um, and some plays uh, play on that by describing certain sort of silly male characters as shuttlecocks. So there absolutely is a sexual element there. And the fact that a shuttlecock is kind of quite light and uh, a little bit feminine looking because it's covered in feathers and that kind of thing sort of also can be used uh, to describe a man who's sort of overdressed or uh, takes too, sort of suspiciously too much care of his appearance. Um, so there absolutely is a kind of um, a synergy there between sexual import and, and that form of playing uh, and the kind of more on the surface innocent looking gameplay. Uh, I'm, I love Callan Davies' work um, and he actually came to the workshop that I've, that I've just described which I was really pleased about uh, and his article came out at a really good time. He's got an article on how the Blackfriars uh, precinct was kind of this site of play, as well as being a playhouse. There were bowling green, or bowling lanes and shopping districts, and it was a kind of really diverse leisure facility. Yeah. Um, the intersection between sport and theatre, I think, is something that we're starting to become more alert to, thanks to work like Callan's. Um, but for a long time, the two were kept very separate. Um, and if you found comparisons to theatre goers, between theatre goers and sports crowds, they were often pejorative. Um, so you might describe the people who stood in the yard at the Globe as like a baying football crowd, as though that's a really evil thing. Although actually I, I find that I have real admiration for football spectators because they have so much knowledge that they've just sort of picked up um, throughout their lives, often without any kind of didactic instruction, but they become expert viewers. Uh, and thinking about an early modern theatre audience as an expert viewer, I think is a really interesting way to think about how we might evaluate what an actor does on stage yeah. uh, that goes beyond speaking the words of the playwright. Um, there's, a, there's a whole other host of physical skills which perhaps early modern audiences were unwittingly trained to pick up on as well. Yeah, we're speaking to um, Alison Bomber in a few weeks, who's a, a text and voice coach, um, works particularly at the RSC. Um, and she was talking to us about um, the need that humans have to vibrate with one another's voices um, mm. and the need for live sound, a kind of um, physiological bodily need for other people's sound waves. Yeah. Um, and she was pointing to um, football uh, arenas as a good example of this, that the gathering to sing and the gathering to shout in opposition to one another, as well as in community mm. with each other, um, is really inbuilt into how we want to interact. With yes. Each other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it works the other way as well in that sport is a very dramatically heightened and theatrical activity and, and com communal sports watching, whether that's today or in the 1600s, is something that's sort of intensely dramatic. Uh, and it's something that uh, sort of contemporary anthropologists talk about in terms of sportification and theatrification and how those are two intersecting ideas. Um, so out and about on the streets, if you were sort of watching people bowling in, in early modern England, you might also be tuning into the kind of performative codes and gestures that, that go along with playing that game. Uh, so I think that both ways there's sort of cross fertilization in that the playhouses are informing other forms of play and, and vice versa. Yeah, thank you. And, and that's true of the moment you've given us as well, where you've got this all female group playing, playing shuttlecocks. Do you have a, a display of the character's social status, but they have the leisure time to be engaging with this? coupled with a display of the actor's skill that they can pull this very complex um, choreography off within yes. the, of the of the stage. Yeah, and it, and it raises interesting questions about what it is then that the audience is focusing on. Um, so the, the audience of the indoor playhouses was fairly diverse in that anyone, there were no kind of exclusions on who could go as long as you could pay the inflated prices. No. Uh, although I, I, I would imagine that there was some kind of gatekeeping going on about who could sit where and so on. We sort of see that at play in uh, Francis Beaumont's The Night of the Burning Pestle, where two citizens climb onto the stage in this kind of audacious way. So you've got there um, a group of 
potentially elite audience members or, or audience members who like to think they are elite sitting very very close to the actors watching them play out this elite pastime potentially with some kind of knowledge about how it should be played mm. um, so you have absolutely got there the, the actor's skill on display being appreciated by people who also know what it's like to play those games um, which perhaps suggests that uh, that audiences are focusing more on these physical displays of skill than they are on what criticism has tended to focus on which is the words of the playwright there's something a kind of act of, of supersedence there i think um one of the other sports we staged was a bowls tournament in john day's the isle of gulls which is now a play that's uh, sort of remembered for its notorious mocking of king james uh it seems like some of the actors sort of did these cod scottish accents uh and the playwright and certainly or almost certainly some of the actors ended up in prison as a result of it um, but again, what hasn't seemed to be noticed is that there's a long bowls match, the longest bowls match in extant early modern drama that plays out amid uh, four people. One of them's in disguise. There's a lot of kind of cross wooing and flirting with one another going and the characters all speak in rhyming couplets. But at the same time, they're playing bowls and some of the rhyming couplets are based on the outcome of the bowls. Uh, you know, how, how far it rolls, you know, you've got sort of that was a good shot or the early modern pentametric equivalent of that line. <laughs> um, uh, but you have to wait until the balls stop rolling before you can say that. Um, so the text or speaking of the text, we kind of imagine rhyming couplets being delivered in this kind of quick fire back and forth way. Um, but staging that game makes it seem much more flexible and that you're sort of waiting to speak the words uh, and speaking the words becomes secondary to the physical demands of playing the game live again for an audience who perhaps is there as much to watch a bowls match as they are to watch satirical drama. Yeah and the boys playing these scenes these, these might be their favourite scenes to be playing as well they're just living and waiting yes. for the, the bowling or the shuttlecock scene. <laughs> yeah you, you would imagine that I, I think it would be interesting thinking now about how all of our relegate, you know, our kind of confinement within our homes has given rise to uh, sort of experimenting with our own physical aptitude through things like Joe Wicks's PE. You know, I, I wonder whether it, there's it, the physical skills we see on display in early modern drama are equally a result of not being able to act all the time and perhaps having all this extra time on your hands. Hmm. Um, you know, we know that these companies were affected by plague a lot, but when in the in the sense of the boys companies who lived together you know where did they go during these times and what did they do um perhaps they worked on their bowling yeah and perhaps the playwrights just as we're experimenting now with what we can do with our bodies in our confined spaces maybe too that these plays are experimenting with as you say these very small um even even by the early modern standard um small playing spaces mm. boys yeah in. um so so one of the issues you raised there, raised there was the issue of time and timing, which is mm. one of the great values of performance workshops for me. You know, how long does something take, whether that yeah. be for an act of bowling to um, be quiet so that you can then deliver your next line? It's the sort of thing we can't identify as readers. Yeah. Were there things in the workshops which surprised you? You obviously went into them knowing these scenes very well and having mm. already done some work with performers. So you may well have had quite a strong sense of what you might get out of the workshops. Did you have that sense and were you surprised in any way? Did you, did you discover things you weren't expecting to find? I think it, it surprised me actually. I had, I had brilliant actors, um, but none of them by their own, you know, they would all admit that they were not natural sports people. Um, although I think one of them was the daughter of a, a bowling champion or something. Wow. But they hadn't, they hadn't passed on. But what, what did surprise me was how quickly if not how quickly they picked the games up, how little rehearsal they needed, and actually how rehearsal really isn't adequate preparation anyway, because if a shuttlecock falls down at the wrong moment, you have to do something about it. Or if a ball doesn't roll as far, or it rolls off the stage, or it rolls under the legs of one of the people on stage, you can't rehearse for that. So we often think about limited rehearsal in the early modern theatre as being uh, a deficit or a limitation or something that we've got a lot better at in our you know, with our luxurious six to eight week rehearsal periods now. But I wonder whether these things can actually ever be rehearsed because if something goes wrong, it goes wrong. Um, and each game will be slightly different. So you have to, actors have to adjust what they're saying, how quickly they're saying it, um, when they're saying it and so on to the physical demands, the immediate demands of playing the game in real time. 
Yeah. Um, so how little rehearsal things needed and also how much scope for improvisation there is or there has to be uh, around um, the demands of playing this game. So it seems like in the case of What You Will, where there's the badminton match, um, there's been some attempt to document that somehow because one of the character's lines keeps having this, as it's printed, has P-U-R written in parenthesis uh, a couple of times, which I sort of wondered was kind of like a Maria Sharapova sort of extreme exhalation as the character hits the shuttlecock uh, and whether or not that's written in it's very hard to time that right uh, or whether that's a sort of record of, of a performance it's it, it's something that I'm still not sure about but uh, it could be a case of improvisation making its way into the printed text rather than the other way around yeah I think there are often some really interesting um, tensions when we have these sorts of conversations um, and here you've told us at the outset about the skills of the performers you're working with Historic, historical and contemporary actors, um, but also about this idea that the text might force an actor to make a particular decision and the mm. idea that you might get it right or you might get it wrong. And I mm. wonder if the issue of, of improvisation and ad-libbing kind of buys you out of that, that idea because you only really start to think of something going right or wrong once you've decided that the text is the most important thing and we have to do what the text says. But yeah. actually, maybe you're exploring scenes where getting it wrong is the point. And the text is there either before or after the performance as a kind of guiding principle. But actually the scene is trying to choreograph play and experiment. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's, that's right. And, and we constantly, anyone who works on historical performance comes back to that question of is the text, which is all we have, a blueprint for performance? Is it a suggestion? Uh, is it a record? And it changes with each text and some people are obsessed with working out exactly where that specific text came from. I, I can't say I'm particularly, <laughs> and often I'm not particularly interested in that until you get a moment like that and you think, why are there these two random PURs in the middle of, in the middle of a speech? Uh, or why on earth would you write a scene in rhyming couplets if you know, you know what playing bowls is like? Um, so that, that question around primacy, I think, is a really interesting one. Um, and I think it does force us to acknowledge that there are other people in play uh, always who aren't just the author in, in creating a play or yeah. a performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Harry, I think that's super interesting and really clear and exciting. So I, I feel like I'm minded to wrap that part of our conversation up, if that's all right. Um, I have really, really valued talking to you about uh, performance skill sets, thinking about staging performance and practical work. Um, working with plays with no editorial tradition, but also, I guess, no performance tradition, right? And you, you mm. with your work, are trying to rebalance that by introducing performers to these yes. wonderful plays. Um, and then thinking about the issue of sport in particular and, and sport on stage. Actually, the one thing I haven't asked you about, it goes back to my first question to you, really, is the difference between running workshops and... Um, so running workshops where you are involved in planning and structuring the performance experiment, how does that compare to the kind of learning you do as an audience member watching, watching shows where you haven't had that active engagement and the decisions which are being taken? Mm, I, I, I think in a way you're, you have slightly more interpretive freedom as, a, as an audience member because you have, there are a different set of stakes. Um, so you're perhaps more immediately engaged. You don't have that same sense of preemption. Uh, if, you, if you're watching a play that you know uh, from reading it, there's, it's, it's perhaps not the same thing, um, but you're sort of, your kinetic attachment to the performers and to your fellow audience members, uh, I think really heightens your awareness of, of the risks that are involved in staging something like uh, a sports match, uh, or even a kind of active, I, I always think of Cleopatra, I'm obsessed with Cleopatra heaving Antony aloft uh, in Antony and Cleopatra. And I, when I saw Sophie Ocanedo do it at the National Theatre, there was a, a audible intake of breath from the audience as mm. Antony kind of slips and, and she recovers him. Uh, so I think you're sort of really, you're engaged perhaps less in the pragmatics, uh, but you are paying attention to the surface level risks uh, rather than just the fictional world of the play. Mm. That's fascinating. Thank you. And I love that idea of kinetic attachment. So that kind mm -hmm. of, that imaginative and I guess neurological investment in bodies moving across the stage and an understanding of the dangers which are attached to that, yes, sort, of, yeah. that sort of movement. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, we're ending these videos by asking contributors um, whether the word literature sits in their professional or personal vocabulary. 
Is that a word that you find yourself using? Is it a word which is useful to you or not? I think I've sort of already hinted at that when I've, I've mentioned sort of text versus performance. Um, I find it perhaps a limiting way to think about plays. Um, we know that early modern authors, or we think we know that early modern authors were very interested in how their plays are received by readers. Uh, so a lot of authors or playwrights do preface their printed plays with um, notes to the reader or um, Ben Johnson famously sort of puts in things that were not performed, but he would have liked to, you know, gives the reader a little bit extra, kind of a director's cut, but written rather than uh, visual. Other playwrights uh, emphasize in their prefaces that you might have bought this book, but it is no, um, it's no match for the actual performance. You know, it, plays are, are to be acted, not, not read. Uh, so I find the word literature when thinking about a play quite limiting, perhaps when I'm teaching them, I certainly try not to, uh, you know, big red cross by the book or, uh, but I, I also try to steer discussion away from thinking about plays as a work of, of solitary creation. Um, mm. I do think, however, though, that lit literature can also be a prompt to activity. Uh, so it's already a record of a huge amount of activity, um, even if that is an isolated uh, act of writing. Um, the fact that we can read it is also a product of huge amounts of manual labour, and it can also be a spur to future activity. You know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if these plays hadn't at some point been decided to be literature and the fact that I can access them in printed books. Um, so I think it's literature can be as much about what one does with it as well as how it's already come to be. I think that's that's probably where I sit with it. It's not a completely dirty word, but it's one that I don't tend to use much. Okay, and not a completely dirty word, which is a prompt to activity. I think that's a great way to think about it. Absolutely. <laughs> Harry, it's been really good fun. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Take care. You too.